All right, if you will take your Bibles and let's look in Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. I want to speak with you this evening on what it is to be established in the faith. Established in the faith. And here in Colossians chapter 2, beginning with verse 4, I just want to read from verse 4 down to verse 7, and we'll see how far we can get here this evening. But Paul writes saying, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, join in beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. And then here in verse 6, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him. And here it is, established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. And I've received criticism from some and continue to receive it from various people who hear my messages, I'm not talking about here in this congregation, but outside the four walls of this congregation, and it's over the insistence, my insistence, uh, that faith is not primarily subjective. In other words, most people, when they hear the word faith, uh, and you know how it is, you know, people, the world uses this way, they say, well, keep the faith, and they kind of make the, the peace sign. Uh, what does that mean? Most people, when they hear faith, they think of something personal that you do or some individual response that you make to God. But the scriptures, particularly where you see the definite article, I want you to see that and, and start paying attention when you read scriptures. Whenever you see established in the faith, it's not talking about something subjective, but objective. In other words, that, that it has substance to it. Because you can say everybody has faith. Everybody believes something. If it's just believing, then there certainly is no judgment. But there's an object to faith, something that's factual, something that's true versus that which is false. And many today see faith just as, as merely believing. They say, well, if you believe, then you're saved. Believe what? Believe who? You know, I have to continue to insist, you know, and this is upon the authority of God's word, that faith is the objective revelation of God that pertains to his son. There's substance to it. We just read it in Hebrews chapter 11. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. This isn't just some pie in the sky by and by. There's, when it says Abraham believed God, God revealed to him the truth concerning his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. When he said, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be, there's substance to that. There's a revelation of the faith. And so as we read scripture, I believe we need to read with that in mind. It has to do with the very substance of the truth, of the gospel. Another word that you could replace the faith with is the gospel. Where it says here, rooted and built up in him and established in the gospel. That concerns his person and concerns his work, his obedience unto death, and what he accomplished in order that God might be just, having justified everyone for whom Christ died. Let me just try to show this to you from other portions of Scripture. For example, in Romans chapter 1, look with me in Romans chapter 1 and verse 5. And you'll see here how this is 
set forth by Paul. He says, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. <laughs> when he's talking about for obedience to the faith, what's he talking about? Obedience to the gospel. And more precisely, it's like he said over in Romans chapter 10, in contrast with those who have not submitted to the righteousness of God in Christ, believers see Christ as the end of the law. He is the end of the law for all who believe. That's the substance of faith. That's what faith shows. That was the substance of the, the promises made to the Old Testament saints that we read about in Hebrews 11. Uh, the promise that God would indeed put away their sin through the death of His Son. All right, look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. When it says here, Watch ye stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men and be strong. He's not just saying pull yourself up by your bootstraps and keep on keeping on, brother. No, but he's saying, Watch ye and stand fast in the revelation of Christ that God has given of His Son. 2 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 13. And let all things be done with charity. In other words, as we have an understanding of Christ and forgiveness of sins in Him, it's going to affect how we deal with others in love and charity. One other verse, and again, we could just spend the whole night doing this, but I want to give you just an example here. As you read the Scriptures, start reading from this perspective. When you see the faith, it's objective. It's talking about the person of Christ and his work. Here in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16, it says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Anybody that has a notion is somehow by their own personal obedience unto God that God is going to consider them just. Here in one sentence, it puts that away, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but notice, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Now some have translated that, the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, and that could well be here, but the point is, this is objective. It's by the faith that concerns Jesus Christ, that has Christ as its object. And when I stop and think, what hope do I have of being justified before God? Well, I look at what this Word says. That's the faith. I look at what God has declared in the Gospel. That's the faith. And by His Spirit, He gives eyes to see. And He says, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by, not just by believing. That's not the sense here. You're not justified by believing. But you're justified by the faith of Christ or the faithfulness of Christ, that's fine, or you're justified according to the gospel of Christ, according to what the gospel reveals concerning the way God justifies sinners. And it says, and not by works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no man or no flesh be justified. But look at here. Remember what I said when I read Hebrews 11? Replace faith with Christ. For if while we seek to be justified by Christ, it's a sin name, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? When he's saying that, he's talking about accusations that some made against him in this message, saying, well, you know, if you're teaching people not to submit to the law, then you're making them sinners. That was the attitude. And he says here, if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Then are you saying Christ is the minister of sin? Because that's what you're saying when you say, well, you know, if you're not submitted to that law, then you're a sinner. Well, you've made Christ the minister of sin then because Christ has fulfilled the law. But he says, God forbid, God forbid. So what is the proper definition of faith? I read 
an old writer on this, and I found this to be helpful. I'll just give this to you. He said, by the faith is meant the doctrine of faith. There's some substance to it. In which sense it is used whenever faith is said to be preached, when you preach the faith, or obeyed, or departed from. When someone departs from the faith, they don't stop believing. They're believing something else. They've departed from the objective revelation of God and Christ. Or they've erred from it, or they've denied it, or they've made shipwreck. Those are terms as you read through Scripture you'll recognize. Exhortations are made to stand fast in the faith, or continue in it, or to strive and contend for it. It's talking about the doctrine of faith. It's talking about a body of truth that God has revealed concerning his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his death. It sometimes is called the word of faith. Sometimes it's called the faith of the gospel, the mystery of faith, most holy faith, or common faith. But what it designs, all of those, is the, the whole scheme of, of truth that is set forth in the gospel with regard to Christ and his obedience unto death. And so I hope that's helpful as, as you... Because this, there's a lot of ignorance in this. You know, people think they understand what faith is, and yet you talk, you realize they're talking about something mystical, something you feel, or something you you do. And make faith a performance. It's a persuasion. It's a God-given persuasion by His Spirit to the heart. Now, does that set aside believing? No. In fact, the word for believing, the verb, is a derivative of the word faith which indicates that true faith or true believing if you will has faith as its object you know faith believing is is to faith what the flower is to the seed if you think of a seed that's the substance the flower is the is the evidence that that has been revealed any true work of the Spirit in the heart, revealing the faith, I believe will be reflected by a oneness with that faith of Jesus Christ. In other words, it's a mirror. What you say you believe, if God, the Spirit is revealed, it's going to reflect the truth. That's why I listen to men's testimonies when they tell me that, well, they're a Christian, or they believe. Well, I believe. I'm a believer. Are you? Well, tell me a little bit about your faith. Now, you put people on the spot, ask them that question, and, and then just sit back and listen. Tell me about your faith. If they're not describing Christ, it's not the faith of Scripture. If they're not, if, they, if they're going back and saying, well, let me tell you about when I made a decision, or when I was a little kid, all this stuff that people refer to, it's not, that's not the faith. Faith has one object, Christ and his death, and what they say about it. Someone might say, well, I believe Christ died for me. Well, what do you mean by that? You mean he actually put away all your sins there? You mean that uh, you were actually justified there when, when he died? Or was there something else you had to do? So these are questions, I think, that are vital. I believe are vital to, to the truth. If you look over in Romans uh, chapter 4, I'm going to get back to my text here because I want to lay this groundwork here because I believe it's vital to our understanding of what it is to be established in the faith. You've got to know what the faith is in order to be established in it. But here in Romans chapter 4, you know, Paul in verse 1 asks this question, What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? Faith is not inherent in anyone. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? And here's what I want you to see. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness, or unto righteousness, unto the righteousness that Christ would yet establish. Now look carefully at this verse. We're, we're not left in any ambiguity here as to what was revealed to him or counted unto him. You see that word counted? That's an accounting term. It means to put to someone's account. Most people, when they read this, they say, well, righteousness was put to his account. But, now wait a minute. <laughs> righteousness cannot be accounted that has not yet been established. 
So it's not saying here that Abraham believed, and so because of that faith, God counted him righteous. No. Look at what was counted to him. Look in verse 9, Revelation 4 and verse 9. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that what? Faith was reckoned to Abraham for or unto righteousness. In other words, God gave Abraham the faith. He revealed to him the faith that pertained to the Lord Jesus Christ to look unto that righteousness which Christ would indeed establish and God would accept and, and God would impute to his account. But he believed God unto that righteousness, you see, that Christ would accomplish. So you see this faith has in faith and believing. You know, Abraham believed God because what? Faith was accounted to him. Faith was given unto him. How do I know that Abraham was the Lord's? Well, he was given this faith that looks to Christ. How do I know any are the Lord's? How do you know? You sit and listen to people's testimony. Listen to what they have to say about Christ and his death. And what he accomplished. Where their hope is. Did he finish the work or didn't he? Did he put away sin or didn't he? Were we justified by his death or weren't we? These are important matters. All right? So how vital is it then to be established in the faith? I want to give you some important reasons for us, I believe, to be taught of God here with regard to this matter of the faith and established in it. I'm just going to begin to go down through this this week, and Lord willing, we'll pick up on this next time. But come back to Colossians, having laid that groundwork on the faith. Here in Colossians chapter 2, I'll just give you these four explanations, if you will, of what it is to be established in the faith. And we're going to look at two of them in the time that we have left, and then we'll pick up with the other two next time. But this matter of being established in the faith, uh, why is it important? That's what I want to answer. Why is it important? Well, first of all, it's because it is the remedy against beguilement and deception. It is the remedy against beguilement and deception. No one likes to be deceived. None of us likes to, to, to believe somebody and then find out afterward that it, it wasn't true. Deception, is it, it tears your heart apart. I don't care whether it's your child lying to you or a, a spouse lying or, or cheating. Now, these are things that they're like knife wounds that go to the heart. No one likes this. Well, particularly with this matter of salvation. I, I sure don't want to be deceived. I don't want to be beguiled. Paul says here in... Colossians chapter 2 and verse 4, This I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Why does he spend so much time reinforcing what the faith is? Some people decry doctrine. They say, well, we're tired of doctrine. Well, I'll tell you what. It's the remedy against being deceived because it's the truth of God. That's the faith. So we're going to look at that here in a little bit. Secondly, why is being established in the faith important? Well, it's because it's the foundation of order and steadfastness. Don't you like order, structure? You notice here in verse 5, Paul says, For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the Spirit, joying and beholding your order, and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. That's what an understanding, a grounding in the gospel of Christ will do. Now it may not, it may not fill the seats in a congregation. <laughs> it may not be popular to the world. But I'll guarantee you where the faith is taught in truth and where the Spirit of God is pleased to reveal it in hearts, those people... Few though they be in number, those people will be established in Christ. They'll be established in the truth. There's going to be order, steadfastness. The world's going to marvel that you're not ranting and raving with all of the nonsense going on in religion, that you're just plotting on. 
unmoved, undistracted by everything else that religion is doing. And they marvel. They say, what is it that drives you? The faith, the revelation of Christ. As he's revealed here in this word, his glory, his death, my hope, you see. So that's the second. And then next time we'll look at the third point here, and that is that being established in the faith is important because it's the instrument of receiving Christ and walking in him. That's why I want to deal with this next time. A lot of misconception of what it is to receive Christ. You have people ask you, have you received Christ? I always like it when they, someone asks me that, I always like to tell them, well, tell me what it is to receive him. Does he come out bodily? Does he come into me? You know, if I open the door, all this talk, people say, well, if you just open the door of your heart, Jesus will come in. That's what it is to receive him. You can bow your head right now and say this prayer and you'll receive him. Is that what Paul's talking about here in verse 6? As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him? No. What he's talking about is receiving his word. What he's talking about is having the Spirit of God open your heart to know and understand what the faith is and how this gospel sets him forth in all his glory. Okay, so we're going to look at that next time. And then the fourth reason why this is important is because it is the means of growth in grace and the knowledge of the Lord. Is there growing? Yes. Verse 7 says, rooted and built up in him. You know, I don't want to leave you the idea that being established in the faith means being stagnant. It's like a brick, you know, you put on the foundation and there it sits. <laughs> There's a growing. Rooted in what? Built up in him. But how? Established in the faith. I trust that the more you hear the truth pertaining to Christ, pertaining to his glory, pertaining to his death and what he accomplished, to the satisfaction of God the Father, that it gives you assurance, it gives you hope, it gives you peace, gives you comfort. It will. It will. There's a resting. There's a settling. I've had several people tell me that in, in recent years as I've endeavored to, to set Christ forth and, and, and show exactly what he accomplished in his death. I've had them tell me, you know, I've never had peace like I have right now here in this message. Why? Because Christ is our peace. I don't struggle with guilt and the idea of forgiveness, knowing that I'm a sinner. Why? Because I see Christ as my forgiveness. I don't strive to try to work out a righteousness. I rest in that righteousness that the Lord Jesus Christ himself has already established and God has accepted. <laughs> That's a message of comfort to sinners, you see. But let me just come back here to these first two reasons why being established in the faith is important and vital. As I said, first of all, it's a remedy against beguilement and enticing words. It says there in verse 4, lest any man should beguile you. That's an interesting word. I love to go back and kind of check out some of these words sometimes in the original. And the language of Scripture is just beautiful. I can understand why the Lord used the Hebrew and the Greek because they're just they're flowery language. They're 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 picturesque. They there's just many different ways to express things that we don't have in English. But this word beguile literally means to have a false accounting. Let's say that you're counting money because it's in this sense. You're counting money and you look away, and somebody that's counting for you tricks you. Either he, he takes out of the amount, he skips over, because he's trying to take advantage of you. That's what this word beguile means. Lest any man beguile you. And as I thought about that, you know the one thing that Satan and this flesh and this world, the enemies of the gospel, would endeavor to do is to rob you, if you will, of... Everything that is yours already in Christ. There has been already an accounting through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the word imputation means. It means that God has already put to your account 
all that's necessary for you to stand accepted before God. That's the message of Scripture. It's in Christ. It's in His death. Sin was put away. Righteousness imputed. The very justice of God put to the account of His people. And now someone comes along and says, yeah, but that's not sufficient. And what they do is get you to get your eyes off Christ and they start taking away, little by little, the very thing that the gospel establishes, your completeness. We are complete in Him. That's why a little later on, you look in verse 8, Paul says, Beware. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. That's what works religion will do. It'll come along and say, well, you're not doing enough. Well, the problem is, it's not based on my doing. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Over in verse 18, Paul uses a different word. You'll see the word beguile is used two times in this passage. So it shows the danger, doesn't it? It shows the danger of being misled. Here it says, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Now it says, let no any man beguile you of your reward. It's not, notice it's not rewards, as in plural, but reward. Who is the believer's reward? Well, it's Christ. What's our inheritance? That righteousness that he worked out. But now people come along and say, yeah, but there's another way to worship God as well. And here it was promoting the worship of angels, a higher, you know, something that's just a little bit better than Christ, as if that could be. And he said, beware. You know, that word beguile here, like I said, it's a different word. It means to umpire against you. Someone calls a foul on you because they're trying to get you to stop. They don't want you going in the direction they're going, so they illicitly call you. They judge against you. That's what that word beguile means. And really, that's what the world is doing in its religion. It's pitting works against the work of Christ. And if it can get you to stop and turn its way and become entangled in its thinking and philosophies and religion, and, and believe me, we're being bombarded we're being bombarded daily. You turn on the radio, someone's holding his Bible. He's not preaching the righteousness of Christ by which we stand accepted. He's preaching what you have to do. And really what he's doing, he's putting the work of Christ alongside your work. It's like, okay, here's Christ's work, now you imitate it. That's the way Christ is preached most often. That's a beguiling. It's a beguiling. So we need to be established in the faith. And again, here over and over and over again. It's like putting driving nails, hit that nail on the head over and over again. Who Christ is, what he accomplished, why he did it, where he is now. All these things, that's our glory. But you notice here it says in verse 4 also, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Enticing words. That word enticing Words means persuasive reasoning and deducing. Persuasive reasoning and deducing. That's what it's, it's not talking about just flowery words, but it's talking about reasoned logic. And, and I'll tell you, there's an awful lot of reasoning and leaps of logic that go against the truth that's set forth here in Scripture. You know, when people read, Christ was made sin. <laughs> This is one that's a leap of logic right now. They say Christ was actually made a sinner by God putting the sin of his people to him. He was actually made a sinner. You'll read statements that say he was the greatest sinner in this world ever knew. That's blasphemous. I like the illustration of light. Christ is light. It penetrates the darkness, but it is untouched by that darkness. Christ took on the form of a man and became a man and suffered under death. He took on him the sins of his people remained untainted by that sin. But people make leaps of logic. Well, if he, And the reason is because they're looking for a righteousness other than in the righteousness of Christ established at the cross. They're saying we're made righteous when the Spirit puts a righteousness in us, inherent righteousness. 
So if that's the case, then Christ must have had our sin in him. But read Isaiah 53. I mean, that's not the language of Scripture. He bore our griefs, carried our sorrows, and we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, afflicted, but he wasn't tainted by our sin. But that, those are leaps of logic, reasoning, people persuading others that this is the way it has to be in order for it to be absolute substitution. No. He was made sin who knew no sin. And that word means never knew sin, never was acquainted with it, not even with God putting that sin on him. You know, there is a word in Greek, if God had purposed, if the Spirit had purposed for, to say that Christ was made a sinner, there's a word for that. It's not used. He was made sin. He was made the sin offering. That's what that means. It's like the Catholic Church when they read, this is my body. When Christ said, this is my body, what do they say? They make a leap of logic. Well, it actually becomes the body of Christ. So then when you partake, that's why you see that priest just taking and trying to put the wafer right on the tongue. of, Because if, if a piece drops, that's actually the body of Christ dropping. That's crazy. It's like if I walk in and see a portrait in your living room and I say, oh, is that you? Well, you know what I mean. It's a picture of you. I don't know, you know, you know, sometimes you joke and say, no, that's not me. Here I am. <laughs> but that's, people make leaps of logic. Why? Because they make an idol out of something that was designed as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Same thing for God so loved the world, John 3.16. Everybody says, well, there it is. He loves everybody in the world. Even though the scripture says, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. There's a way of understanding scripture where scripture interprets scripture. The scripture has an awful lot of light to shed on men's commentaries, and we do well to, to take heed to it. Same thing with the term justified by faith. People insist, well, there it is, it's by faith. But as we've seen, by faith, we're justified by that faith that sets Christ forth as the only righteousness. And again, like we saw, you could easily take justified by faith and understand it's justified by Christ. That's what it is, justified by Christ. Well, there's a lot more here. We just touched on that first point. I'm going to leave it there for now. I don't want to rush through this. We'll pick this up next time. But I hope you see just why it's so vital, week in, week out. Every time we take this word and open it, my prayer is that we be established in the faith. And that through it, Christ receive all the glory.